Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Impact Everywhere, the podcast that looks for people having a positive impact in unexpected places. My name is Benjamin Von Wong, and today I have with us Blair Glencourse from the Accountability Lab. Blair and I met a couple years ago at South by Southwest, and he had just won the South by Southwest Community Service Award. And it was really exciting to meet him because it was like meeting a rock star. We were introduced by a mutual friend called Cheryl Winarek, who is actually my green card lawyer. And she thought we would get along because Blair was working on something really interesting called Integrity Idol at the time, but since had to get its name changed to Integrity Icon because American Idol wasn't too happy about that association. Anyways, Integrity Icon is a really amazing initiative that's been rolled out in over six different countries at this point, with their seventh currently on the way that seeks to raise the work of upstanding people, whether they're police workers, government officials, or teachers, it doesn't really matter. So long as you're a person of integrity, they wanted to really shift around culture to name and fame individuals instead of naming and shaming them, flipping around this whole negative cycle of corruption. After all, if you're not showing people what is good in the community, how are people supposed to know who their role models are? Blair is a really, really smart dude with a degree in economics and has been doing social impact work for almost two decades. Blair advises both the World Economic Forum and the World Bank, but his baby is the Accountability Lab, which has raised over $12 million to support work in order to completely transform the conversation around accountability and integrity in cities and countries that have high levels of corruption. Anyways, enough with the introduction. Let's get straight into the interview. I've just asked Blair what the difference between accountability and integrity is to him, and this is what he had to say. So accountability for me is about answerability. This can get tricky in terms of language, but transparency is part of accountability, for example. It's necessary, but not sufficient. So you can make information transparent for people, governments can make information transparent for citizens. But if nothing is done with that information, if we know that something is going wrong, but there is no answerability, then I'm not sure we're getting quite to accountability. Whereas integrity for me is more of a value. It's more of a mindset. It's more of a way that you live your life as an individual. And in that way, it's sort of less easy to enforce through rules because it's something that you believe theoretically and you live by even though my organization is called the Accountability Lab. If I could rename it now, I might rename it the Integrity Lab, because I think actually what we realized is, is that the rules and enforcement and compliance are not always the best ways to change behavior. And actually, a lot of what we need to do is support different kinds of values and support norm shifts that allow for people to understand why their own values and integrity is actually part of the change that we need. So it sounds like what you're really looking for are people to take accountability of their own integrity without the need for a government or some kind of oversight to happen. Then who sets the moral standard of what is right, what is wrong? Where do you draw the line? Because everyone has sort of a line that's not clear black and white. I think that's part of what we're trying to do with our organization is, is have that conversation. And people often derive their values from many different places. It might be religion, family, school. And I think all of those could potentially be good places to derive your integrity or to understand what it means to be a, a person of integrity. But I don't think it's for us individually to decide that or for us to go anywhere else and project that. It's part of the conversation that needs to happen in a community and needs to be agreed. I think of integrity perhaps as the moral governing principles and the accountability part that comes in is usually some kind of greater power or oversight. So accountability within a household might be your parents, accountability within a relationship might be your significant other. And it's a little more fluid when you're just judging your own actions because you can always make excuses for yourself and rationalize it. But there are some underlying norms that based on how we grew up or what we were taught dictate where the hard lines happen to be. So with all that sort of fluidity in the structure, how is the accountability lab accounting for all of this variance? Because what you're trying to do from what I've seen is almost build an entire platform that can be deployed across multiple grassroots systems, which is super difficult. Yeah, it's really hard and complex. And of course, every society and every community has their different way of understanding these things. And then even within those societies, there are different kinds of accountability. Let's take COVID-19 now. If you're a doctor, your accountability to your to your colleagues and to your patients is to go to the hospital and, and treat them for this virus. But is that being accountable to your family if, if that increases your chances of getting the virus and then infecting them? 
that's not necessarily an obvious choice. And these are difficult trade-offs that we all have to make in different ways. The way that we are trying to do this, firstly, is by changing the conversation. Because as I mentioned, I think conversations around this sort of thing tend to be about calling people out for doing the wrong thing. There's elements of that that are useful, but there's lots of research uh, and a lot of experience that we've had that shows that if you fit that narrative and you celebrate people doing the right things and you point out the solutions and you lift up those that are doing things better or, or changing the way things happen, that encourages others, it inspires others, it creates hope that things can change in really useful ways, particularly young people and particularly in places where things are going wrong fairly consistently and they they have not necessarily seen how things can be different. So that's one thing we do. And the second is what we call building unlikely networks. So really bringing different points of view and different people into this conversation. It's all about financial management issues and corruption and things that sometimes seem quite far away or quite complex. And I think if we can make this real for people and engage them creatively around some of these sorts of things, that then builds these bigger conversations and builds this systemic change or, or movement. So we do a lot of work with musicians because, of course, music is a fantastic way to tap into some of these conversations and engage people in a way that they understand. We do a lot with film. We do a lot with creative artists of different kinds, technologists, all sorts of different people, which sounds logical, but is actually something within development work that often doesn't really happen very much. And then the, the third thing we're doing is building these insider-outsider coalitions. For example, with governments, we don't just work with civil society to demand accountability or demand more integrity. We also work with reformers within governments to try and help them actually develop that yeah, when you talk about changing the conversation and the difference between, you know, compliance versus, I suppose, cultural encouragement, it sounds to me that what you're describing is the difference between intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. You're trying to get people to be intrinsically motivated to be better rather than have an external force tell them that they're doing the wrong thing. So is the work that you do based on behavioral psychology? What is the foundation of how you are creating these conversation changes? Yeah, I mean, you know, very simply, it's the sort of carrot and stick type conversation. And there is definitely some behavioral psychology behind it. There's a train of thought or a theory called positive deviance. These people that are doing something positive in a way that is not usual within their communities and understand how they can model that behavior or how we can help replicate that behavior in ways that can shift the way that these communities function towards more transparency and accountability and integrity. So that there is a lot of theoretical work to draw on, but actually we're finding, at least in our little space, the practice is way ahead of the theory. A lot of this stuff actually hasn't really been rigorously thought and written about in the ways or in the places that we're doing it. So we're now sort of beginning to try and do that ourselves to try and measure norm change, to try and measure how certain ways of talking about issues might affect behaviors, and, and then how you build kind of networks around this to popularize it. I don't know about you guys, but I was really curious to learn a little bit more about what this idea of positive deviance actually represented. In what instances, for example, did positive news actually actively help combat negative news? And so by doing a little bit of research online, we stumbled across this amazing piece by Infodemic, uh, that you can find on YouTube that I just thought I'd play here to give you guys a little bit of context and add a little bit of science into how simply amplifying the positive outcomes that you're looking to see in the world, you can make a difference. Check it out. At the University of East Anglia, virologist Paul Hunter has been studying the damage caused by misinformation since 2015, okay. when he saw the impacts of fake news on the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. We were hearing reports there that people were believing this was a deliberate attack by the government against dissenters. And there were actually episodes of healthcare workers being murdered as a result. And indeed, subsequent research showed that people who believed these lies were less likely to do things to protect their lives. Paul joined forces with statistician Julie Brainerd to model how misinformation affects the spread of a disease. Each one of those little people has their own little probabilities attached to them about the behavior they're going to do, which is meant to reflect that they all make slightly different decisions. The individuals in the model make decisions about whether or not to believe fake news, whether or not to pass it on, and whether to change their behavior as a result, potentially putting themselves at higher risk of catching or passing on the disease. All these decisions are based on data collected from a whole range of peer-reviewed studies from various historical disease outbreaks. J. 
Changing the parameters of the model and running it thousands of times gave Paul and Julie an insight into the power of fake news during an epidemic. Something I didn't expect was how small the change had to be in the information balance. And I only had to tilt that ever so slightly, make it 60% good advice and 40% bad advice to sort of cancel out the effects of the bad advice. The WHO have already taken note of Paul and Julie's findings in their communication strategy. When I look at my social media right now, I can tell that's the strategy they're using. They're just flooding the system with the good, quality, safe, solid information. Meanwhile, governments and public authorities are having mixed results in the fight against fake news. The fact that there's so much of this misinformation about public authorities, it could be very difficult for these organizations to try and dispel you know, this misinformation. So this is just one small example of the kinds of research that inspires Blair to continue doing his work and to spread the gospel of positivity in order to inspire norm change. This idea that 60% of good advice is enough to cancel out 40% of the bad advice gives me personally a little bit of hope that maybe what we need to do is just stop paying so much attention to all the bad news and fake news floating out there and instead focus on simply amplifying the positive work and the good work that is going on. Anyways, back to the interview here. My next question to Blair was asking him, how exactly does he measure the norm change of positive conversations? Because for me, that just seemed like a total black box. We did this process recently in Liberia where we have run a campaign called Integrity Icon to find the most honest government officials. And we used a technique called contribution tracing, which as the name suggests, is about trying to trace the contribution that certain activities have made to certain outcomes. And in this case, the outcome we're looking for is that these icons, these honest people that we celebrate, are able to change norms within their institutions, the extent to which they feel taken more seriously, to which they feel that their influence has grown within their institution, to which people come to them for advice, or guidance, all of these sorts of questions, which begin, as you can tell, to sort of narrow in a bit on whether we're changing norms. Interesting, interesting. So in other words, contribution tracing is almost the determination of what wouldn't have happened if people weren't involved, which I really love because in a conversation that we had in episode four of the podcast with Laura Francois, she said that the best way to think about impact is to maybe not always try to worry about what you've done, but rather to think about what wouldn't have happened if you hadn't gotten involved. So I really love that. Why don't we move on to the topic of unlikely networks? You work all over the world and in a wide variety of developing countries, and you're trying to spread the gospel of accountability and integrity, yet you're not really using the traditional large NGOs or governmental organizations. What have you found to be the most effective way to go about doing this? Yeah, we realized right at the beginning with the Accountability Lab that, of course, there are incredible people all over the place that have amazing solutions to the challenges that they face. And so we see our role as supporting those as much as we can and as building this ecosystem to help those people connect with each other and collectively move towards some of the kind of shared solutions that they're looking for. So we have Accountability Labs in 10 different countries now that are local teams, often made up of you know, former student leaders uh, or activists or people that really know in relation to young people in particular, kind of how change happens, the politics of their communities and their societies, and the ways to leverage different kinds of approaches to these sorts of problems. So in Nigeria, which is a place where there's a, a really big music industry, we work with a lot of leading musicians and music companies to run rap contests for young people with ideas around participation and accountability and anti-corruption and open government and these sorts of things. And they get mentored by senior people within the music industry. And then we help them produce their songs. And then they do concerts and outreach around the country. So for example, we did this around the elections in Nigeria in 2019 and partnered with the elections commission so that to get into the concerts, you had to be a registered voter. And these concerts were headlined by some of these big musicians, but were also included these other younger musicians that we were supporting. Even some of the big leading rappers came out publicly and said, listen, actually, what we've realized through this process is 
in the old days, politicians used to ask us to sing at their campaigns and they would pay us money. What we've realized now is that's not a good way to do things. We, as people with influence and as norm entrepreneurs, as you might call them, people that can create norms, have a role to play in pushing more legitimate governments in integrity and trying to change our society. And this, I think, is how some of these conversations begin and how you can leverage different kinds of people in different ways to, to do this sort of thing. That's so cool. I mean, I love this idea of registered voter in order to get access to a concert. I mean, this would be perfect in the United States. Well, I guess we can't do concerts right now, but that principle is fascinating. And I also really love the norm entrepreneur. I never heard anyone say that before, but I guess that's sort of the, the cultural fabric of all the things that we see. And, and here it's the, the people with influence who are creating things. I get to set the tone and the mood. So when you say these, this unlikely network, Besides musicians, are you saying artists in general, along with anyone that's grassroots? Or what are the main buckets of these unlikely networks that people should be paying more attention to that they might not be? We do also a lot with, with filmmakers, so visual storytelling and photographers and others that, that can tell stories in many of the places that we work that are low literacy. Film is perfect. You can you know get a solar powered projector, put up a sheet anywhere and show a film to tell stories that are relevant. We do a lot with, with visual artists, but by that I mean like muralists. For example, in Liberia, we, we did a campaign recently with some muralists who in busy parts of the capital city would create murals around budget issues, for example, which sound pretty technical. Normally, it's a lot of numbers. It's a lot of stuff that, that feels very distant from normal citizens, but they would translate that into pictures that people would understand and, and draw that up on the wall and then create a conversation around that and had a space next to it where people could kind of write up what they wanted the budget to be spent on. So it was much more interactive, much more sort of contextually relevant, and just a lot more fun for people. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, you're really leveraging the entire power of the cultural sector and bringing them to bear. And then do you also apply the same framework of measuring norms to judge whether or not you've been effective? Because like, it's really hard to measure correlation versus causation in situations like these. Yeah, again, it's, it's really hard. We are you know, trying to measure this. We do a lot of surveys. You know, we talk to people, for example, that have seen these murals and say, what did you think of it? You know, did it change your opinions? Are you going to do anything now that your opinions have changed or not? And I don't think we're ever trying to claim absolute causation. There's many reasons why people you know, change the way they think or what they do. But I think what we are trying to do is, is at least tell some stories about some of this stuff and say, we talked to these people and it appeared that these things happened. We haven't done more rigorous sort of A-B testing or control trials. There's so many different factors in play here. And it is such a long-term process. You know, I think we're talking here about a generational change, not something that could be done in a few years. It's more challenging, but it's something that we're thinking about and trying to get a bit better at. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating to me to hear you talk about leveraging the arts and shifting norms and all these squishy concepts when you have a background in economics, which is kind of like the polar opposite, like go in, measure everything, create all your trials, create your controls. And and I'm curious, how did this get started? How did you create trust in the first place when, you know, you landed into these communities and you're like, I have an idea, guys, we're going to use the arts. Like, <laughs> I think it begins with amazing local partners and teams. I think it's about supporting people within these societies to develop awesome ideas of their own and grow those and connect with each other and share lessons. And so that's what we've been trying to do. So, you know, I worked previously for the World Bank and some other institutions that do have a bit of a top-down approach and realized how badly that can go wrong. So with the Accountability Lab, realized there was a bit of a gap around this kind of issue to engage young people, to really be creative and do things a little bit differently in this space. And there wasn't really an organization that was helping connect these dots. So that's sort of how the lab began, talking to a lot of young people and saying, well, what are the problems you face? And expecting to hear them say things like, well, we want better schools or we want better hospitals. But actually what they said was, we want people in power to be accountable. We want less corruption. We want politicians to be honest. And we have loads of ideas for how to do this, but we don't have the support that we need. So that got us thinking, well, how about if we try and make that happen, try and bring some of these slightly different people, these unlikely networks together. And because we do have these sort of conversations at different levels in different places and across different institutions, maybe we're in a position to then connect those dots in ways that could be useful. That's sort of the mindset. And as I said, it's also 
very much about positivity. It's not about calling people out. It's about lifting people up. It's about you know helping people do the right thing and come together and push collectively for the change that they want to see and not in very disparate, divided ways, which don't always add up to more than the sum of their parts. So what I hear is you just brought worlds that don't normally meet and you just collided them together in order to create this unexpected opportunity after identifying the gap. I'm curious, what does the big institutional like World Economic Forum and World Bank and all these, I guess, what we consider as the world's elite, how are they playing a role in the work that you're doing and how are you bringing those resources and networks to bear in what you're trying to do? So I think I see my role as a bit of a messenger in that way. Like I am lucky enough to be able to get into some of these rooms. These rooms are not always accessible. The process for getting in them is not fair. So I'm trying to use my access to those rooms and those conversations to make them more fair and to make sure ideas that we've been talking about that are solving problems where it matters for people are fed up into policymaking and advocacy and the way that the decisions are made and to open these spaces for other people that deserve to be in them. So I think we definitely see it not as a top-down process, but much more of a bottom-up process um, and opening up these institutions and these conversations. And if we can influence some of these people that do have power and have influence in our existing structures to use that differently, then that is the kind of systemic change that we need. I want to go back real quick to this moment here where you were talking about norm entrepreneurs I feel like everyone today who has a social media account has the opportunity to become a norm entrepreneur because we exercise a tremendous amount of influence to the people that are very close to us. Do you have any advice to people who are aspiring to become norm entrepreneurs to become more effective storytellers? Are there sort of guidelines that you would recommend? It seems like you provide a lot of the information so that people know that it's been vetted and, and that work has been done. But for the average person navigating the world, it's a really messy place of knowing what to spread, how to spread it, what the nuances are and so forth. And sometimes more harm can come out of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think the first thing is to, to start local. Coronavirus, for example, in the US, there's a survey recently that showed pretty clearly that people in the US trust people within their community more than they trust others. So if you're trying to deliver a message, the best person to deliver that message might not be a national politician. It might actually be somebody in the community that people trust, like a doctor, like a religious leader, perhaps like a community leader of some kind. And I'm not sure you can become a norm entrepreneur. There's certain things you can do, I suppose, to get to that position. But I think to begin with, if you are in a position of influence in your community, that is something you can leverage in support of accountability and integrity to change behaviors. And the second is to do it authentically. If you are not a person of integrity, but you talk constantly about integrity, that message isn't going to go very far. Often where a lot of organizations get it wrong with celebrity endorsements and the way that they engage who they see to be influential people in their work. If those people don't live by the values that you're talking about or adhere to the message that you're preaching, it's not going to resonate. You might get someone to tweet something that that is retweeted a lot of times, but is that really influencing? Is that really shifting norms or is it just feeding into the noise that exists, as you pointed out, on social media. And then the third thing is, I think it takes time. We're talking about building trust. This is not something you can do quickly and easily. It's repeated interactions over a long period of time and following up on everything consistently with your audience and ensuring these feedback loops. For example, in communities, you're trying to work out what problems are. You're not just asking people for information and then saying, listen to me, this is what should be done. It's a constant iterative process with communication back with communities so that it feels like it's co-created and it is a process whereby others have a voice. It's not about you preaching. It's really a collaborative effort. Interesting. Yeah, that idea of a feedback loop is sort of an accountability cycle. It's like making sure that you are saying the right thing that is resonating and doing just as much listening as you are doing talking to, to make sure you're still staying on track, right? So I think that really resonates. I want to play devil's advocate here for a second, though, because in episode 15, I had a human trafficking survivor from Kenya called Sophia Tende come on, and she made a really interesting point that we need to stop elevating people because people are corruptible and power corrupts. And you know, when you elevate a person and that person eventually becomes somewhat of a hero printer, people who pursue ideals and ideologies, maybe the greater good at the expense of a few... And her contention was that it was more important to focus on finding people that believed in the movement rather than 
than a person. So I'm curious to know what, what are your thoughts there? So I, I completely agree, actually, and particularly in this social entrepreneurship space, I think there's far too much emphasis on individuals and not enough on teams uh, and on the collective. And that's really dangerous. It's always a collective effort and it should be about the movement. So this TV show, Integrity Icon, that we have, which is about finding these honest individuals, we learned very early on that it isn't just about them. And so we try and really emphasize the support that they get from their team, the mentorship they've received from their superiors, the ways that they're changing this, not just as an individual, but as, as part of a larger group. The individual is useful and I think dangerous because it, it helps you tell a story that can be compelling. But I think that story definitely has to include elements of the collective and of an understanding that actually change happens through many people. It's, it's not about some superhero that can do everything on their own. Okay, great. Well, let's expand a little bit more on Integrity Icon and these questions that you're asking people. When you judge whether somebody is an Integrity Icon doing the work within their community and is an upstart citizen and so forth, what are some of the parameters that you're judging them by? And can you share maybe a couple of these questions? Because I think they're really important takeaways for an individual to even ask themselves as they're going through the world and trying to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. So Integrity Icon is a campaign that started eight years ago when we were watching, I was in Nepal with our team there and we were watching Nepali Idol, which is the equivalent of American Idol on TV. And and we suddenly thought, what if we tried to combine this media-driven, popular engagement type approach with this issue of integrity and accountability and came up at that point with what was called Integrity Idol, so we got volunteers on board and the very next day they went around to citizens all over the country and said, hey, do you know an honest person? Would you nominate them for this Integrity Idol award? And these were not elected officials. They were bureaucrats, civil servants, so teachers, nurses. And it was amazing. We didn't really have any money and weren't really expecting much. We just thought it would be fun. But we got, I think, three or 4,000 nominations that first year, narrowed it down to the top five, and then we filmed them. And we put very short films on a youth-driven TV station and we got millions of viewers. So we opened a, a voting hotline and people could vote by SMS for their favorites, got hundreds of thousands of votes, and then celebrated the winners at a big national red carpet Oscars type ceremony, trying to change things up, bring some glamour to this issue, which can often seem a bit mundane. And it was brilliant. The winner, who was a district education officer from the east of the country, is just an, an amazing man. He'd done all sorts of things. He'd turn up in disguise at schools to check on teacher attendance. He gave out his phone numbers to parents. And if they had any problems at all, they could call him. He fired any teachers that were in any way corrupt and revamped the training program and brought in new teachers, all of this kind of stuff. So amazing. And when he went back to his village uh, or his town after the campaign finished, we have a video of him arriving and there's thousands and thousands of people on the street chanting, he's our hero, he's our integrity icon. It's suddenly getting people excited about something positive and being for something, you know, not just protesting against corruption, but coming out on the street and celebrating people who are honest. So we knew that we were onto something. And since then, it's now in 10 countries, you know, millions and millions of viewers in these, these spaces, some big partnerships now with media companies, and much more of an emphasis now, not just on those individuals, but on their teams. And, and after the campaign, what we can do to help them with their teams to build integrity within their communities. But the process has remained relatively simple because we want it to be accessible. We want it to be understandable. So we're not asking people to give us very technical explanations of how people have demonstrated integrity, but we do ask for examples. We do very deep background checks through government systems, within communities. There's a seven-step process for verification. We also include a panel of expert judges who are independent people within those countries that really understand integrity to provide their opinions on what this person does and, and what integrity means. So it's a combination of different approaches. And, and that doesn't mean we've always got it right. We've had a number of issues where we have selected someone and almost got to the point where we were filming them, for example, and then have discovered that they weren't quite a person of integrity as we thought. And even more so these days in the environment in which we exist with fake news and with you know all of the noise on social media, we found some pretty serious efforts to take down some of these individuals, paying newspapers to print certain stories that are untrue, for example, creating social media campaigns to denigrate the name of some of these icons, because of course they are challenging the status quo. They're trying to change something and that means they create enemies and it means that people push back 
against them. It's getting difficult, to be honest, for all of us to identify what the truth is and who's honest and who isn't. But I don't think that means we should stop trying and we're going to continue to try and build them. We've just started this in the US for the first time at the city level in Philadelphia. So for any of you listening in the US or in Philadelphia specifically, please nominate an honest government official today. You can do that on our website, integrityicon.org. And we'd love to hear about them. We'd love to profile them. And we'd love to lift up honest people in, in Philadelphia, which, you know, which is a city that needs integrity in government if we're going to build that trust to improve our societies. You know, as I hear you talk about this process and the challenges with fake news, I mean, reputations take decades to build and seconds to tear down. And what we're seeing increasingly, the bigger your name, the more the opportunity for slander occurs. We look at someone like Bill Gates and, and the number of conspiracy theories that have emerged, or even someone like Dr. Fauci, which previously had no reputation, now gets to be elevated to, to, to the point where people want to tear you down. It feels really, really frustrating to sometimes look at this war for information or war against misinformation. And are we as humans with our primitive emotional brains doomed or is there, is there still hope for integrity and, and the truth? I think we have to be optimistic, uh, of course, and in keeping with our positive approach at the Accountability Lab, we would 100% say we're not doomed. You know, there's so many awesome things happening, so many great people doing incredible stuff. I mean, I agree with you, of course, it's getting more and more difficult, but I think it also comes back a little bit to this sort of issue of values and integrity. It's critical from the very beginning that you live by your values, because if you slip up even once, there's always this sort of slight smell, this sense that maybe you're somebody that could be corrupted or someone that won't do the right thing if the incentives change. And that doesn't mean that we all don't do things wrong or that we all haven't lied. Of course we have. But it means that as much as we can from the very beginning, resist these pressures to engage in some of these behaviors. And those in some societies are much stronger than others. And the incentives and the relationships in many places are set up in a way that leads to corruption. We talk about this in many of the countries that, that we work, that people often say to us, I'm a government official, but I'm literally called stupid if I don't engage in the corrupt systems, because that's just the way things work. That is the system. If I don't take care of my family by stealing money, that makes me a stupid person. And I completely understand that. So how do we change it? Again, this isn't about rules, because if the system is set up with rules that push corruption, then there's nothing that you can do. We need to shift the behaviors. We need to shift the norms and make it easier for everyone to stand up and say, we want things to be different. If one person is standing up and saying, I'm not going to adhere to these rules, they are ostracized, they are dismissed, they lose their jobs. In some cases, if you're pushing back against corruption, it can be life-threatening. But if everybody stands up and says, actually, we want everything to be different, and we're all going to push for that change, then we have more of a chance. I think that's why young people are so key to all of this, because there's a generational shift happening. And, and this generation are more willing to challenge the status quo than any other generation before it. This generation can collectively say 20 or 30 years from now, we don't want to be having the same conversation. We don't want to be part of this system, which hasn't given us the opportunity and, and the inclusivity, the, the transparency and accountability that we want. But of course, we're talking about changes here that are going to take 10, 20, 30 years minimum. So I think the structures of the way that we do things and the way that we fund this work and the way that we understand movements need to change. So yeah, it's a long-term difficult process. Well, what you just described of people rising up against the status quo goes in both directions. I've, I was reading a crazy article about the rise of the, the outright within Germany and how their special forces have been massively infiltrated by outright pro-Nazi movement individuals and they're stashing weapons, they're stashing bombs because they believe in the second coming. And so there's sort of that idea of tearing down a system is actually a similar language that we see the right as well as the left trying to leverage. And it just so happens that the language of violence rather than the language of integrity is a lot more alluring, probably because of all the cultural norms we have from watching too many movies. So really, it always comes down to the individual, like what you said about the importance of living by your values. What are some of your values? Great question. I think clearly, you know, integrity is one. I don't think that I haven't made massive mistakes, that I haven't done things that lacked integrity. I definitely have. But I'm trying to live by that value. And certainly within our organization, that is a core piece of everything we do. 
I think collaboration is another huge value for me. This isn't something any of us can do on our own. It has to be in collaboration with others. Positivity is another big one, if you could call that a value. There is so much going wrong and it is so easy to become depressed and pessimistic about the state of the world. And I think we have to try and move beyond that. There are always incredible people doing the right thing. And some of our integrity icons are, are just exemplars of that. Like in some of the most difficult places under the most difficult circumstances are somehow managing to maintain their integrity and to do the right thing, even when no one is watching. And so we've developed phrases of thinking about this sort of stuff. And one of them is catching people doing the right thing. It's about finding people who are not looking for the spotlight, who are not doing this for any kind of reason except to make their communities better. And catching them doing that is very powerful. And naming and faming them for doing that rather than naming and shaming the bad people or the people doing the wrong thing. And the more we can tell these stories, the more it helps us then combat this larger issue of pessimism and this information and of this sense that nothing will change. After hearing Blair talk about his values, it left me wondering what some of the integrity icons might say to that exact same question. And I found this clip online in 2018 from the integrity icon South Africa cohort. And this is what they had to say about their values. Integrity, I believe it is somebody who has compassion for others. To me, it means putting the community first and leading an honest and simple life. It means that if somebody challenges you, you would stand fast. You need to be strong enough to do the right thing when no one's looking. And to firstly becoming the best you you can become. That is integrity. So what you just mentioned there was really great, having integrity, you know, the spirit of collaboration, community, which you had mentioned before, but how can integrity go beyond just like not doing anything wrong? Like, how do you know when you're doing enough and how do you stay motivated to keep doing more and to continue pushing the bar higher? Because I think that's where the transformation actually happens. If you just sit back and do no wrong, I think, you know, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I think it's kind of how we've ended up where we've ended up, because we all believe fundamentally that we're pretty decent people, yet that's not enough. So how do we close that gap? It's a great and really difficult question. How do you measure your values? How much you're adhering to them it is really hard and is obviously a, a personal thing. And I do think it begins with all of us. I think we're far too willing to point the finger at other people in our societies and say, well, you know, there's a problem in my community, but it's because this person in charge isn't doing their job. And that might be the case. You know, Donald Trump is not doing his job in the US at the moment, for example. But there are many other reasons why problems are happening. And it grows from us. Like the people that we elect reflect us in a democracy. And the norms that we hold and the values that we find useful or the behaviors that we find acceptable reflect us. And so it begins with us. If we lie within our family, is it to be expected that our kids or our family members will then lie outside our family? We have to, in even the smallest ways, model the behaviors that we are talking about and try and be accountable and responsible, like turning up on time. That's an accountability issue. Our work is often about much bigger corruption issues and huge issues of political exclusion and those sorts of things. But it's still really important to talk about these very small things within our own lives and within our own organization, because it does grow from there. And to some extent, if you want to measure and enforce that, we could take account of how many people are late for meetings uh, or how often we ourselves are late for meetings, which some organizations do, of course. But I think it's much more about kind of celebrating, you know, when things go well, celebrating what works, celebrating people doing the right thing to encourage others and, and demonstrate that behavior in ways that are useful. And I think the final thing I'd say about that is it, it, it's not about money. The easiest thing, you know, many people think that they can do is, is to donate to a good cause. And of course, that's important. Good causes need money. But I think I would encourage people to go a bit further and donate time and ideas and networks and other resources that can be equally as valuable as money. Very good. It almost sounds that the thing we should bring more into our lives actively is words of affirmation. Like when you see something good, call it out, celebrate it, create systems to celebrate the ones that are doing good things. And while no person might be perfect, integrity is maybe not even a value we have, but rather one that we aspire continuously to and work towards, right? Definitely. And, and that's particularly the case at the moment when there's just so much bad news and it's relentless. Calling out these people doing the right thing and, and telling some of these good news stories is really powerful.
All right, last question before tuning off here. If you could ask every single person in the world to do one thing differently in their lives, what would that thing be? I mean, the thing that comes to mind is what we just talked about, you know, lifting up others, celebrating others, naming and faming. But I think maybe to take one step beyond that, it would be to find ways to support what they do. So it's not just calling them out. It's in your own way saying, what can I do to help you do more of this awesome stuff that you're doing? What can I do to connect you to people that can amplify your work? What can I do to support you around this change that you're trying to create? I might not have huge amounts of time or money, but maybe I can do X or Y. We can't just leave that to other people. We ourselves, all of us have to step up one way or another and take some risks and think differently and and push for the kind of change that we want to see. But that doesn't just happen on its own. We have to do it ourselves. So encourage and engage. If people want to follow you and learn a little bit more about the work that you're doing, where might they go find all of the stuff? We'd love to be in touch with people. We're all about building these unlikely networks with all sorts of different people. So please do find us at accountabilitylab.org or on Twitter at accountlab or on Facebook at Accountability Lab. So yes, please, we'd love to love to be in touch with anyone that's interested in what we're doing. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time, Blair. Really Thanks, appreciate ben. it. Really good to chat. Alrighty, there you guys have it. Blair Glencourse from the Accountability Lab. You know, I find it so interesting that integrity and accountability is such a core part of our everyday being and doing and the way society functions. Yet it's something that we almost take for granted, especially in the Western world. We just don't even think about it. Yet in this age of misinformation and fake news where we are constantly having to judge the truth or the lies that we are facing on a daily basis, it's becoming an even more important question to ponder and Maybe we can start with ourselves in terms of how we show up in the world, what we want to be accountable to, and who we're going to be holding accountable along the way. If you're enjoying this podcast, make sure to follow us at Impact Everywhere Podcast on Instagram, where we post regular quotes and snippets for everyone to share out with their community. Because after all, sharing is caring. No point having all this wonderful knowledge in the world with nobody learning about it. Next week, I'm really excited to share with you the story of Mark Brand, who is a chef and a design thinker who has started over 13 different companies. Once upon a time, he was homeless, and now he uses every waking moment of his life in business in order to help those less fortunate than himself. I can't wait to introduce him to you, and remember to stay inspired because impact is everywhere. <laughs>